Sorry, wrong one. <laughs> okay, so today we wear our pricing hats. So, uh, as we go through, you're going to see the shift in focus as we go from value to price. We've already started the process of talking about the difference between value and pricing. Uh, so let's start with the test. Now, most people out there do pricing. Now, most equity research analysts, most investors, and they, they're pretty open about the fact that they don't do this DCF stuff. And one of the reasons that people give for pricing is their argument is when you do discounted cash flow valuation, you've got to make a lot of assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk. But when you do pricing, you don't have to make those assumptions. So my question is a very simple one. Is that true? I mean, if that's the reason why you're doing pricing, is it true that you're not making assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk when you do pricing? Anybody want to give it a shot? What do you think? Do you think that's true that you don't make assumptions? No. I don't think it's true. Okay. We always make assumptions. So the difference between the two is you make explicit assumptions in discounted cash flow valuation, and you make implicit assumptions when you use a price earnings ratio of 35 or an EV. Any time you use a multiple, you are making assumptions about something, about the fundamentals. The difference is you make the assumptions implicitly. Which one's easier to defend, implicit assumptions or explicit assumptions? It's much easier to defend implicit assumptions because you don't know what you assume, they don't know what you assume, what's to defend? Explicit assumptions require defense. One of the things we're going to talk about today is why people like pre pricing. It's much easier to defend an EV to EBITDA of 8 than it is to defend a discounted cash flow valuation. In fact, I'm going to give you a very simple technique to back out from a multiple what the fundamentals are that drive that multiple. So that's going to be a big part of the way I think about pricing is, hey, when you give me a PE ratio, what's embedded in it? Let's build on that. Let's assume, and as we will today, that you estimate the PE ratio for every stock in the market. And you put up a histogram. Remember histograms and statistics? You count the number of stocks, PE ratio, 0 to 4, 4 to 8. You put it on a histogram. Will that distribution of PE ratios ever follow a normal distribution? This is requiring you to dig deep into your statistics, right? What's the essence of a normal distribution? First, it's symmetric. That's one part of it. But it's more than that, right? It's not just symmetric, but it's also got tails that go out to infinity, right? Remember that? The tails keep going and going. So can a P-E ratio ever be normally distributed? What's the question I'm asking? Can a P-E ratio be minus infinity? Can a P-E ratio be negative? It cannot. In fact, if the earnings are negative, you say not meaningful, not available. For, so P ratio is floored at zero. But what's the cap on a P ratio? What's the highest a P ratio can take? There is no cap. It could be 50,000, 100,000, 500,000. 
I remember my statistics class, my professor making a big deal about asymmetric distributions, skewed distributions. And my response was, who the heck cares? I should have cared more. Because if you have a symmetric distribution, there's all this neat stuff you can do. Like what? Especially if it's a normal distribution, you can talk about the average or the plus or minus one standard errors, and you can draw all these conclusions. But when distributions become asymmetric, you're going to find yourself running into trouble with basic numbers. For instance, if you look at PE ratios, the floor is zero, the cap can be any number. When I compute the average PE ratio for a group of companies, what's going to happen to it? If all the outliers are big positive numbers and there are no big negative numbers, the average is going to get pulled out, right? You think, that's obvious. How many times do you hear sales pitches from analysts saying, this stock is cheap because it's trading at less than the average PE for the sector. You got an opening the size of a Mack truck to bring the sales pitch down. What's the only question you need to ask that person? What were we trained to do in statistics? When you have an asymmetric distribution, you're told not to trust the average. What's a more meaningful metric? Look at the middle of the distribution, the median of the distribution. When was the last time you saw an equity research analyst talk about the median PE? But basic statistics says if you have an asymmetric distribution, you've got to be careful about using things like averages and two standard errors and all that other neat stuff you can do with a normal distribution. And finally, let's assume you have a stock that is trading at a PE ratio of 12. Let's assume the average PE for the sector, in this case the software sector, is 20. The question is actually poorly worded, so let me ask you the question differently. What has to be true for you to conclude this stock is cheap? I mean, people do this all the time. They compare the actual PE to the average PE for the sector. Under what conditions does that actually indicate cheapness? What has to be true about the company? Remember we said implicit assumptions? What are the implicit assumptions you make about the company? That it's really like your average company in terms of growth, cash flows, and risk. And if that is the case, then of course it's cheap. But could a stock trading at a P-E ratio of 12 be expensive in a sector where everything trades at 20? Absolutely. So what has to be true about its growth rate? It's probably negative. Its cash flows are horrific. And its risk is sky high. That becomes the key to pricing, is controlling for those differences. Because all you have to do is compare a company to the, the average. You're going to draw all kinds of strange conclusions. So we're going to do pricing right. That's basically the way to think about the next few sessions. Is not that we're, I'm not going to try to talk you out of pricing, and I'll explain in a few minutes why. Because the reality is, if any of you are going to have valuation-related jobs, get rid of the valuation word. Your jobs are pricing-related. You're going to go for a bank and work in the IPO team. Your job is to price companies. It's not to value them. So the banking team that's working on the Pinterest IPO couldn't care less about what the true value or the intrinsic value of Pinterest is. What's their job? To take it public and make sure every share that's offered on the offering day gets sold and perhaps at a pop for, the, for those investors. Why? Because there are other people lined up or ready to go. Most of our jobs, if, even if you think of them as valuation jobs or pricing jobs, I think it's time we did it right. So let's turn to the second packet. Incidentally, I've been told the bookstore actually has surprised me and actually has the second and the third. I actually made them do both packets together. If you want to buy it at the bookstore, you're welcome to. If you print it off yourself, that's fine as well. So let's start on the second part of this class. And you're going to notice things start to move a lot faster because the foundations are really intrinsic value foundations. So let's start with the process of pricing. To price something, you need to go through three steps. First. You need to find other assets that look just like the asset you're trying to price. Remember, you know, last session we looked at a house and we looked at other houses. So first step is finding those comparable assets, comparable companies. Second step is, you notice very quickly you can't compare market prices across stocks. Why not? If I just based expensive or cheap based on just the price per share, What's the most expensive stock in the market right now? Berkshire Hathaway has six digits in its price. The most, what's the cheapest? I, I think the last movie pass price was 0.00006. I'm not kidding. It's now down to millicents per share. It's not only a question of time before they do it. They keep you know, doing a reverse split to make it into a dollar stock. Sooner or later, there'll be only one share at a dollar trading on the company. But at 0.00006, the stock is not cheap. So, 
you can't compare prices, so you got to scale prices to something. Does that sound familiar? That's what a multiple is, right? PE ratio, price to book, EV to EBITDA, you're scaling market price to something. That's the second step. So you pick comparables, you scale your price to something, and then you compare across the companies. And if you're careful, you notice your company has higher growth or lower risk, and you tell me a story. Every pricing has those three components. Here are your comparables, here's the multiple, here's the story. And you bring them together, you got a price. So I'm going to start off with a statement about pricing that I've been pretty much saying all the way through, but now I'm going to back it up. At the start of this class, I said much of what passes for valuation out there is really pricing. And let me back that up. This is about 20 years ago. I collected about 550 equity research reports from around the globe. I must confess I didn't read all of them, but I collected them because I wanted to chronicle how equity research analysts put a number on a stock. Out of the 550 equity research reports, 45 were discounted cash flow valuations. 45, less than 10%. 450 were pricing, multiple comparable story. Seeing 45 plus 450 is 495. What about the other 55? They were kind of scary. It's like an analyst in search of self and you know, mystical missions. So basically, the remaining 55 I gave up. I had no idea where the number actually came from. But among the ones I could count, 10 to 1, pricing outnumbered valuation. The job in sell side equity research is pricing. So I said, maybe it's different in corporate finance. So I was able to get my hands on about 100 acquisition valuations. You know how difficult it is to get your hands on a banker's acquisition valuation? Because the minute they do the valuation, they put it under lock and key, probably destroy it so you can never see their forecast and compare them to the actual numbers. But I have my sources, and I got the 100 acquisition valuations. And at first sight, it looked like it was about 50-50. 50% looked like they were DCFs, and 50% were pricing. And then I took a closer look at the DCFs. And I re realized very quickly that they weren't DCFs. They were pricing in drag. The drag component was the cash flows up front, but the biggest number, the terminal value, came from six times EBITDA, 10 times earnings, two times book value. So pricing masquerading as a DCF. So even in acquisitions, pricing seemed to rule the game. And almost every rule of thumb in investing is based on a multiple, right? Like what? Price to book ratio less than one is cheap. Peg ratio less than one is cheap. A PE ratio less than eight is cheap. EB to EBITDA less than six is cheap. I know where the rules of thumb come from, but they're based on pricing. And that left me a little puzzled, because I don't know whether you remember, but in the second session, I asked you a question. I said, it's an unfair question. I said, if you were to pay, I remember I did that very brief introduction to intrinsic valuation and pricing, and I said, if you had to pick one, which one would you pick? And he said, I have no idea. I haven't done this yet. When you, on this 26th session, the last session of this class, I'm going to ask you that same question. Now that you've done, by then hopefully your project, not even hopefully, your project will be done because that's the day it's due. So you'd have done a DCF, you'd have done a pricing for your company. I'm going to ask you, now that you've tried your hand at both, which one do you trust more? And I'll let you pick. And in the 53 semesters and 32 years I've been teaching this class, the breakdown has been roughly 70, 20, and 10. 70% at the end of this class say that they like intrinsic valuation more. Reflecting my biases, I know that that's playing there. 20% say, I like this multiple comparable thing. It works much better for me. This DCF stuff, too many moving parts, I don't feel in control. And 10% become believers in efficient markets after they've actually tried to value one stock. Because they say, look, this isn't as easy as it looks. Maybe the market's not as stupid. I mean, remember that. We think of the market as this irrational, crazy thing. It's an amazing device to actually come up with a number for a stock. And you think about all the things that are swirling around you. And that's fine. That's a healthy recognition early on that you don't want to waste your time and your money valuing companies. You might still have a job in valuation. That doesn't stop you. Eh? But in your personal portfolio, you put all your money in index funds and you move on. But among the people leaving this class, 72, they walk out saying, we're true believers in intrinsic valuation. I've never done this, but I should track people down five or 10 years after they take this class, especially in valuation, or what they call valuation, say, hey, now that it's five years out from the class, what are you actually doing? I'll wager the numbers get switched. That if I look at that, that, that group, 70% are doing pricing. Something seems to happen between the time people leave this class and you start working, which 
turns you from true believers in intrinsic valuation to accomplished practitioners in pricing. So I started thinking, what could that be? Why does pricing end up winning this war so much of the time? And I could think, I think, came up with at least three reasons you're welcome to add to the list. The first is we forget how much of valuation is selling. We think of valuation as analysis, but it's selling. Selling to who? Selling to your colleague, selling to your boss, selling to your client. It's far easier to sell a pricing than it is to sell an intrinsic valuation. You know why? Because all you have to do to make your case is pick the right comparables. This came to me while I was watching a Seinfeld episode. If you haven't watched Seinfeld, you should. No, it's a quintessential New York sitcom. In one of these episodes, one of Seinfeld's many girlfriends accused him of being crazy. He said, Jerry, you're crazy. And he says, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who lives across the hall from me. Talking, of course, about Kramer. And relative to Kramer, who's crazy, right? The essence of pricing is you have to show me something is cheap. Just pick something more expensive. You have cholesterol at 300? Not too bad. Relative to people who've died of heart attacks in the last week, you look pretty good. All I have to do is pick the right comparables and I can make any number look good or bad. And if you're, if you're selling something, you can see how convenient it is to sell something with a pricing. Second, a lot of valuation is playing defense, right? You come up with a number, people like to pick it apart. And when you do a DCF, it's so easy to pick apart. I don't like your beta. Why do you use 10 years of growth? Why is your growth rate so high? If in contrast, I use six times EBITDA, because that's what other companies in the sector trade at. Think of the target I've given you, it's tiny. You don't like six times EBITDA, take it up with the market. That's effectively what I'm saying in pricing is whatever the number is, you don't like it, it's not my fault. You don't like to pay 40 times revenues for a cloud company? Well, most cloud companies trade at 50 times revenues. You don't like it, take it up with the market. And finally, here's an unpleasant truth about intrinsic valuation that people who do intrinsic valuation have to admit. I'm a believer in intrinsic valuation, but I'm also, I also know I'm going to be wrong a significant percent of the time. So let's say, even if I do everything right, I'm going to be right 55% of the time. That's an incredible success rate in investing if you can be right 55%. Let's say I get that 55%. And let's say you're a really good pricer, and you're right 51% of the time. Remember, random prices do 50, you're 51. 55 beats 51, right? So based on those numbers, you say, most people should be doing intrinsic valuation. But here's the catch. When you're wrong with intrinsic valuation, you're far more likely to be wrong alone. You know why? What does intrinsic value lead you to do? Buy stocks when everybody, so you're buying Boeing because everybody else is dumping Boeing because of that Boeing Max thing. You're selling stocks, you're selling Lyft because everybody, so in a sense you're going against the crowd. And that's part of the reason you win that 55%. But when you're wrong, you're wrong alone. And what happens to people who are wrong alone? They get fired. When you use pricing to pick stocks and you make mistakes, you're always going to have lots of company. And the advantage of having lots of companies, your defense is, hey, don't pick on me. We were all doing it. We just pushed up tech stocks because everybody else was doing it. You're far more likely to survive as a portfolio manager or a sell-side equity research analyst if you do pricing than if you do intrinsic valuation. In fact, I call this the market imperative. The more you are judged against the market, the more your job is to do what the market is pricing, the more you're going to be drawn to pricing. So if your job is to, to price an acquisition or price an IPO, your job is pricing. It's not valuation. You should be doing pricing. If you're a portfolio manager, how do you get judged? You don't get judged against, did you deliver my expected return? You get judged against other portfolio managers. If you lose 15%, it looks bad until everybody else has lost 20%. Say, I look pretty good now. We live in a relative world. I mean, it's almost Einsteinian in terms of how we think about pricing. Everything is relative. Your returns are judged, your performance judged, and no wonder pricing ends up dominating. So when I first started teaching this class, I used to try to talk people out of pricing. I was a true believer in intrinsic valuation. I no longer do because the reality is your jobs will require you to price things. You can sit there with your DCF model, but nobody's looking at you, listening to you because they have a job to do. They have deals to get done. 
So I'm going to argue that if we're going to do pricing, we need to do it right. That's basically going to be my frame and with which I approach it. So I'm going to approach it as somebody wants to do pricing. It's not my first imperative, but I want to do pricing right. So let's first start to disentangle the mechanism that you need for pricing. You need a standardized price. In the case of real estate, if I have a three-story building and a 19-story building next to each other, obviously I can't compare the price of the three-story building to the 19-story building because the three-story building is always going to look cheaper. So in real estate, what do real estate developers do to standardize price? They divide by square foot. This is not something we invented in business, but we get incredibly creative with stocks. In the numerator of every multiple, no matter what the multiple is, is some measure of market value. It could be just the market value of your shares, market cap. It could be market value of equity plus market value of debt, though you might cheat and use book value of debt, which is the market value of the firm. Or it can be market value of equity plus market value of debt, though again you can cheat and use book value, minus cash. Market cap, market value of the firm, enterprise value. Numerator is always a market value. The denominator is where the differences arise. I can take your market value and scale it to revenues. Why am I doing it to revenues? Desperation. If all the numbers you have negative, I keep climbing until I hit revenues. What if I have a pre-revenue company? I get even more desperate. I look for things that might give you revenues, like how many subscribers do you have? How many members do you have? How many downloads do you have? How many cars are parked in the parking lot? I need a positive number in the denominator, and I'll get it by hook or by crook. Don't be surprised if when Uber goes public, people are comparing the price per rider or price per driver. Because you need something in the denominator you can scale to, and it has to be a positive number. So it's going to be a revenue or a revenue driver. It could be earnings. The earnings could be equity and earnings, which could be net income or earnings per share. Or it can be to the entire firm, operating income. It could be a cash flow. If it's equity cash flow, it's net income plus depreciation. It's a kind of a half-assed cash flow because there's no capex in working capital. But remember, the whole reason you're doing pricing is you want to keep things simple. Or it could be operating income plus depreciation amortization, which is EBITDA, measure of cash flow. It could be book value because, after all, the accountants are trying to tell you what the company's value is. It could be book value of equity. It could be book value of equity plus book value of debt, which is the book value of the firm. Or it could be book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. Does that sound familiar? That's invested capital. So basically, the numerator is always a market number. The denominator is a scaling number. So when you look at a multiple, the first step is to start breaking down. What's in the numerator? What's in the denominator? Because I'm going to take you through a four-step process that I'm going to be pretty religious about no matter what multiple you throw at me. I'm going to start off by defining the multiple. This is going to be mildly or majorly insulting, depending on your background. Because yeah, I know what the PE ratio is. Do you? When you talk about PE ratio and I'm talking about PE, are we talking about the same thing? I'm going to argue that we need to nail it down before we start talking, because there are so many variants. I'm going to define the multiple. Second step, I'm going to play with some money ball. I'm going to describe the multiple. Sounds fancy. But we have the data now. It's not 1965. I can look at the PE ratios of every chemical company, the price to book, the EV to EBITDA. So I'm going to look at the distribution. I'm going to draw what I can statistically from that distribution. Then I'm going to analyze the multiple. Sounds fancy, but I'm going to go back to an intrinsic valuation model. You can say, but I thought we'd left intrinsic valuation behind us. I'm going to argue that by going back to an intrinsic valuation model, I can tell you what variable should affect a multiple. You know why you should care? Because those are the variables you're going to have questions for and control for when you compare across companies. I'm going to give you a preview. When you talk about price to book, here are the variables that drive price to book. Your return equity, your expected growth rate, your risk in equity, and your payout ratio. So if I give you a stock with a low price to book ratio, you know exactly what questions to ask. And only then am I going to apply the multiple. My problem with pricing is people are in such a hurry to do pricing. They don't want to do the first three steps. They just want to apply. Define, describe, analyze, apply. So let's take each one and work it through. Let's start with the definitional test. When you look at a multiple, there are two questions you need to answer. The first is, is this multiple consistently defined? The second is, is it uniformly estimated? Let's start with the first one. Is it consistently defined? Remember I said every multiple is a numerator and a denominator? It's a very simple rule and a very powerful one. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator has to be an equity value too. 
If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator is to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. It sounds incredibly abstract. So let me throw a few multiples at you. You tell me whether they're consistent. Let's take the PE ratio. Most widely used multiple in the world, right? Numerator is an equity value, firm value, or enterprise value? It's an equity value. It's market cap or price per share. Denominator is earnings per share, which is an equity net income. Thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world is OK. It's considered numerator and denominator, both equity values. Enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. What's the numerator? Market value of the operating assets of the company. And in the denominator, you have a measure of operating cash flow. EV to EBITDA is OK. What about price to EBITDA? The analyst invented this multiple should be tarred, feathered, and driven out of the fraternity. This is a horrifically bad multiple. And out of the 550 equity research reports, eight used price to EBITDA. One happened to be an old student of this class. So I decided to give him a call. He said, who is this? I said, remember that valuation class you took a few years ago? He said, vaguely. <laughs> I said, it shows. I said, what the hell are you doing dividing market cap by EBITDA? It's not consistent. He said, no, no, I'm being consistent. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I use price to EBITDA for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, it's a very weird definition of consistency. And I said, have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt keep looking cheap to you? He said, yes, yes, I've been noticing that. He said, have you ever stopped and wondered why that might be happening? Do you see the connection? What's an enumerator? Market cap, right? So if I go out and borrow five billion, buy back shares, and knock them off, my market cap is going to drop because I have fewer shares outstanding, right? But my EBITDA is earnings before it. I can borrow till the cows come home, and the EBITDA is still the EBITDA. Guess what? The more levered you are as a company, the cheaper you're going to look. Before you get too superior, though, if you ever use price to sales, you've been guilty of the same sin. You know why you got away with it? What sectors do you see price to sales used the most in? Technology. And why do you get away with price to sales and technology? Because these companies tend to have very little debt. Price to sales sometimes shows up in retailing. Why? Because the retail firms tend to have similar debt ratios. You got away by accident. If you're going to use a revenue multiple, a more consistent version is, instead of dividing price by sales, you should be looking at enterprise value to sales because it is internally more consistent. Is my multiple consistently defined? Turn to the second question. Is it uniformly estimated? You're saying, who cares? You're going to compare PE ratios across 15 companies. You've got to hope and pray that these 15 companies estimate earnings per share the same way. Because if they don't, all bets are off, right? I used to think that if you had the same accounting standards governing companies, we were home free. But it turns out that you can have the same accounting standards govern 15 companies and different degrees of fidelity to those standards. You're not even breaking the rules, you're just bending them. Aggressive companies always look cheaper to you because they're bending the rules, pushing up earnings. And conservative companies will look expensive. You might have to go back and re-estimate the earnings for every company because you don't trust the way they're done. S&P actually tried to offer this service and found no takers because the demand was not there. They actually uh, you know, did a service where they took all of the companies, took this, the reported earnings, which followed Gap, and then did the adjustments to make them consistent. Some of these companies set aside money to cover pensions, some did not. They tried to create consistent earnings, thinking that people would pay for more consistent earnings. But they discovered analysts didn't care. Now, after all, these are the same analysts that allow you to add back stock-based compensation on some crappy logic that I still haven't figured out. I was consistently estimated, defined, uniformly estimated. So let's take a few multiples and pass it through the test. Let's start with PE ratios. Everybody knows what the PE ratio is, I think, because people throw it around. In fact, I remember about 30 plus years ago, subscribing to Barron's. In those days, you actually had to fill in a form and send it in for subscription. You know why I did it? Because they offered a free calculator with your subscription, a calculator that claimed to compute PE ratios. Remember, these are the days before Wi-Fi. I said, this is amazing. I should subscribe to Barron's just to get this. And I get this calculator. It's a like, cheap $2 calculator. It comes with instructions on how to compute PE ratio. Here's what it says. Enter the price. 
hit slash, they didn't even say divide, hit the slash button, enter earnings per share, hit the equal button. I got exactly what I deserve. PE ratio is price per share divided by earnings per share, right? I should have seen this coming, but I did not. Even Anna Kornikova seemed to know what the PE ratio was. Do any of you remember Anna Kornikova? She masqueraded as a tennis player for like a decade, won nothing. It was like half a dozen commercials. She was like a Maria Sharapova without the talent. <laughs> 2000, Charles Schwab makes a commercial with Anna Kornikova in it. I almost canceled my Schwab account right after that. So in the commercial, and still on YouTube, you can go check Anna Kornikova Schwab commercial. I don't know what else you find on Anna Kornikova, so don't go to the other sites. I don't you know. <laughs> So here's what the commercial does. Anna Kornikova is playing somebody. Must have been an actress. She was actually winning. So you know in tennis, every two games you switch sides. So they're switching sides. In the middle of a tennis match, I don't know why this would come up, Anna turns to the actress and says, P ratio is price divided by earnings per share. And then she kept going on something about preferred dividends that went completely over my head. Then I turned off the TV and said, does Anna Kornikova really know what the P ratio is? The numerator is usually the current price. Unless you've got one of those technical analysts gone crazy. You know the ones I'm talking about who like to use moving average prices? I've never figured that out. I've never been able to buy a stock at a moving average price. But they like to moving average. But usually it's a current price. It's in the denominator that you get the real differences, right? I can divide price per share for a stock by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year. Which for some of your companies is still 2017, right? I can divide price per share by earnings per share in the last four quarters, which is called trailing P. So when I divide price by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year, I get current P. Price divided by earnings per share in the last four quarters is trailing P. Price divided by expected earnings per share in the next four quarters is forward P. And price divided by earnings per share in the year 2028 is really, really forward P. You think why would I do that? Desperation again. You're the biotech analyst. You have 25 companies in your sector. They're all losing money. The only tool you have is PE ratios. You're kind of stuck, right? So here's what you do. You project out the earnings for every company 10 years. And you tell me a company's cheap because it's trading at six times 2028 earnings. I've never been able to figure out what I'm supposed to do with it. But I can see why you do it. You can look at earnings per share before extraordinary items, after extraordinary items, before stock-based compensation, after stock-based compensation. Next year, I guarantee you, retail firms are going to report earnings per share before the lease adjustment, after the lease adjustment. A few weeks ago, I sat down and I computed P ratios for Cisco, one of the most widely followed stocks in the market. I came up with, I think, 27 different PE ratios that I could call PE ratio, depending on how I defined earnings, ranging from 13 to 32. You think so? Let's say I want to go on CNBC next week and get you guys to buy Cisco, based on the pricing. Which of the PE ratios do you think I'm going to mention? Cisco looks cheap. It's trading at 13 times earnings. If I'm trying to convince you Cisco is expensive, I'm going to say, you know what, Cisco is expensive, trading at 32 times earnings. One of the funniest things to watch on CNBC, everything's kind of funny on that show because, you know, is two analysts, bullish and a bearish analyst, talk about the same stock. Notice how the bullish analyst always uses forward numbers. Forward earnings, P ratio looks good based on forward earnings. And the bearish analyst will always use trailing earnings, simply because lower numbers make it look cheaper and higher numbers make it look more expensive. But if you dig it deeper, it is a consistently defined multiple. But you can already see that when you say the P ratio for a stock is 8, before I even address whether it's cheap or expensive, I'm going to ask you a question. How did you come up with the P ratio? And you're going to look at me and say, hey, well, even Anna Kornikova knows what the P ratio is. And I'll say, Anna is smarter than me. Why don't you tell me how you compute? Because I, I can't even respond as to whether it's high or low until I know how you define earnings per share. In fact, if I'd been making that Kornikova commercial, I'd have made the actress turn to Anna and say, forward earnings or trailing earnings, Anna. Then we'd have figured out whether Anna Kornikova really knows what the PE ratio is. Incredible number of variants. So let's take this and use it to draw the consistency argument further. Let's assume that your sector is the technology sector and you like to do pricing and your weapon of choice is PE ratios. So you're trying to decide how to compute PE ratios so you can compare across these stocks. So you can make an unbiased comparison. And here's what's throwing the analysis off. 
some of these stocks have no options outstanding, some have lots of options outstanding, some are in the money options, some are out of the money options. So I'm going to list out a bunch of different variants in P-E ratio and I want you to think through whether this is an unbiased way to pick stocks. I could divide price by primary earnings per share where I take the net income and divide by the actual shares outstanding. Which stocks are going to end up looking cheap to me if I use price to primary earnings? Remember some of these stocks have no options, some have lots of options. Stocks with lots of options are always going to look cheap and here's why. If I have lots of options, my market cap, what I'm observing in my common stock will be much lower. If I'm dividing by the primary earnings per share, which is taken by taking the net income and dividing by the actual shares outstanding, I'm going to bias myself towards stocks which have a lot of options. They're not cheap, but they look cheap. I could be giving away the farm, but the stock looks good. Okay? I could divide price by fully diluted earnings per share where I bring in the options. This is good, right? I no longer have a bias, or do I? Not all companies with lots of options are affected the same way. Well, it depends on whether the options are in the money or out of the money. So if I divide by fully diluted earnings per share, if you have stocks with options that are in the money versus out of the money, the stocks with options in the money are going to continue to look cheap. But the companies, so already you can see that no matter how you define per share numbers, there's no escape here. Every per share number is going to come with a catch. So you know what you should do? If you're, if you're computing P-E ratios for stocks, and this is something I do generally now, what should you do? If per share numbers are what's creating the trouble. You're trying to decide the share count and you can't decide. How should you compute the P-E ratio for a company? Just take the market cap. If you are careful, you will add to it the value of the options like we did in DCF value, but that's a lot of work, so do something with them and then divide by net income. Stay away from per share numbers. I don't believe per share numbers anymore. I don't know what the earnings per share for Lyft is. I have no idea what the analyst is using as a share count. Is he counting restricted stock units, not counting them? Easiest thing is go back to the aggregate numbers. All you need is a ratio. So when you see companies which have other claims on the shares, option claims, always go back to aggregate numbers. When I first uh, started looking at equity research reports, probably in the 1980s, EV to EBITDA would show up like once every 50 reports. It was a very uncommon ratio. People didn't look at, look at it very much. Somewhere in 85 or 86, the t people started using enterprise value to EBITDA more and more. Today, if you walk into an equity research house, I would say my guess is a third to half of all equity research is based on EV to EBITDA. It's the, the multiple of choice for analysts. Some for good reasons, some for bad reasons. But before we delve into why EV to EBITDA has taken off, I have a question about the mechanics of EV to EBITDA. The way EV to EBITDA is computed is you take the market value of equity plus the market value of debt minus cash. In theory, it should be the market value of debt, but as I said, people often use the book value of debt. Market value of equity plus debt minus cash. Or net debt, if you prefer to denote the last two items. Right? and in the denominator of earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation. So I'm, I'm a very simple question, if you, especially if you're an analyst who's used EV to EBITDA, now you're welcome to jump in and tell me why. Why do we net cash out of the numerator? Why do we net cash? Okay. There's a much simpler way to say just what you said, which is, the income from cash is not part of EBITDA. The reason we have to net cash out is a consistency reason. If the income from cash is not part of EBITDA, you've got to net it out. And you know what? I've opened a Pandora's box. Remember the Tata Motors picture that I showed you? I wouldn't go through the full valuation. One of the big problems with the Tata companies was what? That they had cross holdings in other companies. Do you see what? If I ask you to compute the EV to EBITDA for a Tata Motors or a Tata Chemical, you have to take market value of equity plus debt minus cash. You know what else you should be netting out of the numerator? Why do we need to take cash out? Because the income from cash is not part of the denominator, right? If you have cross holdings in other companies, remember we said that income doesn't show up until you get below the operating income line. I should be netting out the market value of those cross holdings. What a nightmare. But guess what? You thought you could get away from it by running from DCF to pricing. It's going to chase you down if you have cross holdings. And if you have majority holdings in another company, 
then all heck breaks loose. So let's say you own 60% of another company. Let's go item by item. What does the market show as part of the market value of equity? It shows only the 60% you own. Markets don't consolidate, they're not crazy. So your market value of equity reflects only the 60% that you own. Everything else comes from consolidated financials. So the EBITDA, the taxes, I'm sorry, the EBITDA, the debt, and the cash all reflect 100% of the subsidiary. You got a mismatch. The market value of equity reflects only 60%. Everything else is 100%. So how do we make this whole again? What do we need to do? Wouldn't it be nice if we could add back that 40%? And in fact, there's a very convenient item on the balance sheet that claims to be the value of that 40%, right? What am I talking about? The minority interest, the, the non-controlling interest? You'll often see analysts adding minority interest back to the numerator. And what they're trying to do in a very half-assed way is trying to fix the problem. Why half-assed? Because you'd be adding the market value, the 40%. What you're, in effect, adding is the book value. Cross-holdings make EV calculations incredibly messy. Forget about comparing. Just computing the EV to EBITDA becomes incredibly messy. Next time you see an EV to EBITDA for a company, check its balance sheet. But there's cross-holdings. You might have more work to do because a company might look cheap for all the wrong reasons. Because you forgot something in the numerator, you forgot something in the denominator. And one final example. In the aftermath of 2000, when a lot of people got blindsided by the collapse of housing, people said, you know what the big problem was? We never knew housing was in a bubble because unlike stocks, we have P-E ratios which you can compare over time. With housing, how do we know whether housing is in a bubble or not? So a few people in housing who were think, thinking about this problem said, maybe we can compute a ratio like a P-E ratio for a house, even if it's residential property. And here's what you do. You take the price of the house in the numerator, and then you divide by the rental income you could make if you rented the house out today. You see how this is like a P-E ratio? When this ratio becomes really high, you're paying much more for houses than you can generate as income. So they came up with the ratio. And then they said, it would be nice to compare it to other asset classes. If I'm trying to decide whether to put my money in housing or stocks, I'd like to compare this ratio I've computed for housing, which is house price divided by rental income, to something analogous in the equity market. So I'm going to give you the choices, because you want to compare apples to apples. Can I compare that to the PE ratio for stocks? Well, I mean, in a sense, with pricing, it's supposed to be all implicitly included anyway, right? I mean, basically, you're paying for whatever. You think so? You think not? Tell me why not. In other words, when you buy a house, you don't buy it with equity, right? 80% is borrowed. By using the housing price, I have the equivalent of enterprise value in my numerator. And if I have the equivalent of enterprise value, the question we've got to ask is, what does rental income approximate to on a company's balance sheet? So what would be the analysis? Is it like revenue, I think? Is it like EBIT die? Is it like EBIT? Yeah. That's an answer I often get, but is it really sales though? Because when you collect rental income, it's actually, you're just collecting the income directly, right? So, you know, I've heard the sales argument. If you use the sales, housing will always look expensive. I think it's closest to EBIT done. Let me explain why. You collect the rental income. You still have to meet depreciation and amortization. It's true you have expense, but let's face it, the, the expenses you have tend to be real, relatively small. You have a depreciation amortization that you can still subtract out. It's closest to EBITDA. So it might be nice to put up a graph of EV to EBITDA for stocks across time and housing prices to rental income across time. And I've been trying because the problem with the, with the second, uh, the first one is easy to get over time. The second one is tougher because it's only recently that people have started computing it. But if any of you are interested in housing, this is something that could be a m good macro indicator that you can use to compare across time. So the closest thing, I think, is EV to EBITDA. But even there, you can say, well, expenses are there. So it's, there's nothing purely analogous because you know, there's nothing on an income statement. That's exactly what rental income becomes. But this is something that I've seen with residential properties, especially where you can make a judgment. Because commercial properties, it's probably easier to do. 
But residential properties, you could look at the implicit rent that you could have charged and say, am I getting a bargain on this, on this house? So that's the first stop, is the definitional test. Let's move to the second stop. Okay. Second stop, you're just playing money ball, as I said. You're looking at the data, and you're trying to extract as much information as you can. My problem with a lot of pricing is we throw away so much data. We use the average, we're throwing away the rest of the data. So I'm going to show you histograms of multiples. It's my starting point. That's where I always start. Because those histograms are going to give me a sense of what's high, what's low. I don't need some rule of thumb. I can tell you, based on the histogram and the distribution, what's expensive, what's cheap. And as I do these histograms, you are going to find this asymmetry I talked about. Along the way, I'm also going to talk about the biases I create because I throw away some of my companies in my sample. With pre price earnings ratios, I've already told you that if I have negative earnings, I take the companies out of my sample. I'm going to talk about the biases that come in. Because almost every service reports PE ratios to the S&P 500. Take a look at five different services. They all have different PE ratios for the same index, the most widely followed index in the world. So let's start with the distribution. Start of every year, once I, I start with my 43,000 all publicly traded stocks, I compute the PE ratio for every one of them. And once I have that big Excel spreadsheet, I do a histogram, basically count the number of companies. This is a histogram for just US stocks of trailing PE, that's the, the, the column to the extreme left, the current PE and the forward PE. So first, remember I talked about asymmetry, you can see it very clearly, right? Peak to the left, tail to the right. Now I'm going to dig a little deeper into this distribution. I ran all the standard statistical descriptives on it. I started with the average. You know what the average PE for US stocks was? It's over 77 at the start of this year. Scary high number, right? Nobody talks about 77 times earnings. But before you freak out, that is the average PE. The median PE is about 19, which is much more sensible. You're saying, why is the average PE so high? Hey, there's one company out there with a P.E. ratio of 48,700. You're saying that must be one highly priced stock. The stock price was actually $7.50, but the earnings per share dropped to a fraction of a cent. The P.E. ratio was through the roof. You're saying, I would have seen it. If I just gave you the average and you did not see the rest of the distribution, you can see how deceptive averages can be. But here's the other interesting statistic. I started with 7,209 U.S. companies for which I had data. But only 2,965 ended up in my PE ratio sample. So what happened to the other 4,300? They had negative earnings. I lost two-thirds of my sample. I, they all had prices. That wasn't the issue. But two-thirds of my sample. It wasn't a recession year. I've been doing this now for 20-plus years. Every year, I lose two-thirds to almost three-quarters. In a recession year, I could lose three-quarters. You think, what's the big deal? You still have 2,965 companies. That's a big sample. You're right, it's a big sample, but it's a biased sample. And here's why. I'm not losing 4,300 companies randomly. I'm losing the most troubled, the youngest, the highest growth companies are going out of my sample because they have negative earnings. We create bias in the most subtle ways in the choices we make. In fact, as I go from current PE to trailing PE to forward PE, take a look at the forward PE numbers. I've lost another 500 companies. So what happened to the forward PE that made me lose another 500? What do I need for forward PE? Forward earnings. forward earnings. I'm not sitting there estimating next year's earnings for 7,300 companies. So guess what I look for? An estimate of earnings for next year, which if you're followed by analysts, you get. And if you're not followed by analysts, it shows up as not available on capital IQ. I lost 500 companies, and these were the companies not followed by analysts. You think there might be a bias there? These are the smallest least followed. So basically, I'm losing, creating bias by going to any time you go with forward earnings, that's a bias you create. I mean, statistics, we talk about bias samples all the time. In finance, we very just ignore them and we keep moving. And you can see how bias samples get created. Until 2004, I used to do these, these histograms based on just U.S. data because my database was, was a value line database that had only U.S. companies. And I would land in Mumbai or you know, Sao Paulo. And I'd show this distribution of US PE ratios and say, hey, PE ratios are asymmetric. They have a peak to the left and tail to the right. And some old analyst in the room would put up his hand, usually in his 50s or 60s. It doesn't look like that in Mumbai. 
So how do you know? Gut feeling. And after about the fifth or sixth gut feeling, I said, I'm not trusting your gut anymore. I'm going to go look at the data. And starting in 2003, I've shifted three different databases. Now I'm an S&P Capital IQ. I've been doing PE ratios for all publicly traded companies. Start of 2019, I now have PE ratios across the board. I've tried to put them all into the same distribution so you can see what they have in common and you can also see what they have different. What do they have in common? They all have a peak to the left and a tail to the right. Whether I look at Australia, New Zealand, Canada, you know, emerging markets, developed markets, Europe, you know, it doesn't matter. They all have a peak to the left and tail to the right. But when I put them all in the same distribution, I can also look at the differences. And my favorite device for looking at differences is to look at the, 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 not just the average, but at the, the tenth decile. The, in other words, look at the entire distribution. Let's focus on the median. If you want to pick the cheapest market in the world based just on PE ratios, where would you go? There's only one market in the world with a single digit PE ratio, which is Eastern Europe and Russia. And that already should point you to the dangers of just picking stocks based on low PE ratios. Do you really want a portfolio of just Russian stocks? They're going to look cheap, but they're cheap for a reason, right? They're cheap for a reason, and your earnings might not be your earnings. Per shares might not be per shares. And your country risk and commodity price risk, because many of these companies are oil companies embedded. But looking across the PE ratios, you can see the, the most expensive market in the world at the start of 2019 was China. It was in China, 20.63. Yeah. That was 33 last year. China was also the most expensive market last year. It lost. The, the market had a bad year. But even after the loss, it's still the most expensive. The U.S. is now at 15.8 times earnings, the median P across all U.S. stocks. Okay. Again, I'm not going to overread this, but it's good to get a sense of cross-sectional distributions. And I do this with every multiple. So when you tell me a stock is cheap, before I make a conclusion, I say, what part of the world is it in? Is it in Russia? So 10 times earnings might look cheap to you, but relative to the median, half of all Russian stocks traded less than 10 times earnings. It's good to get a sense of the entire data. And when there are differences, perhaps, perhaps there's a way in which you might use it in your investment decision. Start of 2013, for instance, I computed price to book ratios by region. And if you look at the outlier, it's obvious. The outlier at the start of 2013 was Japan. The typical Japanese company, the median price to book ratio for a Japanese company was well below one. 2013 was an incredibly good year for Japanese stocks. I won't jump to any strong conclusions, but if you're going to make regional allocations, perhaps you should start by looking at the entire distribution. Not on anecdotal evidence, not on rules of thumb that apply. And finally, my favorite use for this distribution, I use it all over the place, is any time somebody gives me a rule of thumb, it drives me over the edge, especially when it's an absolute number. And my least favorite rule of thumb is that six times EBITDA. I remember sitting in on a debate, it wasn't even a debate, a discussion of valuation with a big LBO guy, I won't name the guy. And he was talking about a company and I said, why do you pick this company? He said, it was obviously cheap. And I said, What's, what is so obviously cheap about it? He said, it's EV tab, but was less than six. So I'm waiting for the rest. He said, well, that's it, EV tab, but was less than six. I said, that's your measure of cheap? Anything that's less than six times EBITDA? I said, that works pretty well. So when somebody says EV debit does less than six, rise to the challenge. Give them a list of every stock that trades at less than six times EBITDA. Middle of 2000, January 2010, you told me six times EBITDA is cheap. Half the market was trading at less than six times EBITDA. Well, maybe it's a good definition of cheap in 2019 because stocks have gone up. Do you see where I'm going? An absolute rule of thumb is going to get us into incredible trouble. In up markets, nothing is going to look cheap. In down markets, everything is going to look cheap. If you're going to have a relative valuation rule of thumb, a pricing rule of thumb, instead of making it six times EBITDA, what should you do? You have the entire distribution. Pick a decile. You want to make the 10th decile? So basically, I'm sorry, the, the, the 10th percentile of the first decile? Okay, then look at that and make that your cheap. So if you define that as cheap, you know, the first quarter, so the first quartile is cheap. Any stock that trades at 7.6 times EBITDA is cheap in the U.S. today. But that rule can't apply in Russia. So why not just look at all of the data and create these flexible rules? You're saying, it's going to be so difficult. It's not anymore. You've got access to Capital IQ just like I do. 
You got facts there just like I do, and even if you don't, you can cheat. Yahoo Finance probably provides the numbers for a sector. You can do this now. You could not have done it 30 years ago. So this second part, I'm basically saying, let's look at the data. Let's not throw stuff away like we have, because there is information in the data. Just like Billy Bean saw Kevin Euclid walk a half a dozen times in 12 at-bats and said, this guy is the guy I want on my team because he gets to first base. You get to first base, whether you get a base hit or walk. No, it's amazing. Until, until Moneyball came along, people were so caught up in what's your batting average that they never seemed to think about how much you get on base. Of course, they got a little carried away with all the statistics now. But I think that's exactly where we are now, is where baseball was in 2001 is we're in a place where we have the data, but we're not using it to make judgments about pricing. Define, describe, let's analyze. I told you embedded in every multiple are all the assumptions you make in intrinsic valuation. So I'm going to give you a very simple device for backing out what those implicit assumptions you make is, and then follow up by asking, if those fundamentals change, how will my multiple change? So let me give you my device for backing out a multiple. So Name a multiple. Let's say you want to analyze a multiple. Give me any multiple you're interested in. P. P. Okay. Equity multiple or firm multiple? Equity multiple. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the simplest equity valuation model I can think of. Why simple? Because my algebra is not that good, so I want to keep it simple. What's the simplest equity valuation model you can have? A stable growth, dividend discount model. I know it's old-fashioned boring, but to get the value of a stock, I need expected dividends next year divided by cost of equity minus growth rate. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the simplest equity discounted cash flow model. So an equity discounted model, I say the value of the share is expected dividend next year. I'm going to write it as earnings per share times the payout ratio, kind of an expanded version, divided by R minus J. What am I trying to do? Price earnings ratio, right? Am I allowed to divide both sides of an equation by a constant? They say yes, you are, right? It still is an equation. So if I divide both sides of the equation by earnings per share, what do I end up with? On the left-hand side, I end up with price divided by earnings. On my right-hand side, I end up with the payout ratio, dividends divided by earnings. I can give you the variables that are P-E ratio. It's payout ratio, cost of equity, and the growth rate. You want price to book? I'll divide both sides with the book, book value. And I, if you divide earnings by book value, I end up with the return on equity. I'll give you the variables that drive price. You give me any equity multiple, I'm going to go back to the simplest equity discounted cash flow model. And you don't even need to be that strong in algebra, right? It's a simple equation. You need move things around. You should be able to tell me the variables that drive any equity multiple. Let's pick a different multiple. Give me an enterprise value multiple you're interested in. Um, EV sales. EV to sales. Thank you. You picked a multiple that's already up there, so let's do it. Go to the simplest enterprise value model that you can think of, which would be a stable growth, free cash flow to the firm model. The value of a firm is the expected free cash flow to the firm next year, and I've written it in an expanded version as after-tax operating income times 1 minus the reinvestment rate, divided by cost of capital minus the growth rate. I want EV to sales. I divide both sides by sales. You gain a constant. It's not changing the equation. If I divide EBIT times 1 minus T by sales, what do I get? I get the after-tax operating margin. I can give you the multiple that you're not trying to go back to intrinsic valuation. What you're trying to do is extract the variables that should drive a multiple. So I'm going to use that as a very simple device. And I'm, I'm going to take your P-E ratio because, as I said, most widely used multiple and break it down. You go back to a dividend discount model, you divide both sides by earnings per share, you end up with an equation for a P-E ratio. And it's a function of the payout ratio. The 1 plus G means you need next year's cash flow divided by R minus G. There are only three variables there. Payout ratio, cost of equity, and growth rate. Now your pushback might be, why are you using dividends? We know companies don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends. You're absolutely right. If you don't trust dividends, what could you use instead? What they could have paid out in dividends, which is free cash flow equity, or dividends plus buybacks. This model is flexible enough for you to do whatever you want to do to reflect payout. You have the variables then that drive P-E ratio. This, to me, is the key step in using multiples well, is understanding the variables. You know why? Because you're going to be hit with sales pitches. I'm going to come and say, hey, you know what? I have a stock for you. It's trading at four times earnings. It's really cheap. So ask me the questions. That will tell you whether the stock is cheap. What's the first question you're going to ask me? What's its growth rate? Most of the time, what's the answer going to be? Minus 15%. That explains it. Take that off your list. If it's plus 5%, your second question is going to be, hey, well, how, is there some risk I don't know about? Maybe the CEO is absconded with half the cash in the company because it could be high risk. So 
that to affects the cost of equity. So it could be your it, it could be a growth rate, it could be a cost of equity, or it could be how efficiently you deliver the growth rate. The payout ratio there is a standard for, hey, you have a 3% growth rate. Are you getting there with an 80% retention ratio, which is awful, or a 10% retention ratio that's good? You're asking me fundamental questions to decide whether a stock with a PE ratio of 4 is actually cheap. Because most stocks that look cheap deserve to be cheap. And you're trying to figure out which stocks that look cheap are stocks that I want to put my money in. Now that, that equation with a stable growth dividend discount model obviously can't be used if I wanted to actually get the PE ratio for a, no, I don't know, for a sales force. High growth company, obviously you can't put it into a stable growth dividend discount model. So there's a version of this model that I'm going to present that's going to look intimidating when I first put it up. But it's actually a very simple present value equation. Let's say I have high growth for the next five years, and then stable growth after that. Now normally, how do we value the stock? We take an Excel spreadsheet, we project out the earnings and dividends for the next five years. The end of five years, we compute a terminal value, we discount it all back. I could actually take what you have in your Excel spreadsheet and write it out as an equation. Let's say your dividends are going to grow at 20% a year for the next five years. You have a growing annuity, right? There is a present value equation for a growing annuity. The first term in that equation looks fancy, but it's just a present value of dividends during your high growth phase. It's a growing annuity equation. At the end of five years, what happens? You become a mature company with a growth rate forever. There's your terminal price in the second term of the equation. That's a terminal price discounted back. You think, why write it as an equation when we have Excel? There are advantages to writing out what you have in an Excel spreadsheet as an equation. And here's why. When you look at a high growth stock with a high P-E ratio, what's the thing that worries you the most? What if growth changes, right? So what is the question you want to ask is, as growth changes, how will the P-E ratio change? Do you remember high school calculus? I know you don't. Most of us don't. If you were using high school calculus, what is the question I'm asking? I have an equation for the P-E ratio here. As growth changes, how will the PE changes? That's a first, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do this on the third quiz. But if you really wanted to and your math skills are strong enough, you can take the first derivative of the PE ratio to the growth rate and tell me how as growth changes, the PE will change. How as risk changes, the PE will change. In fact, if you don't want to brush up on algebra, just spend the money and buy Mathematica. Enter the equation of Mathematica. It'll do all kinds of fancy stuff. First derivative, second derivative. You can go crazy. Three-dimensional graphs. You have no idea whether you're climbing a mountain or falling into a valley. But it looks so colorful while you're doing it. This is just a way in which you compress what's in an Excel spreadsheet. But I'm actually going to use it in a much more pragmatic way. Let's say you come to me with a high growth company. I can't put it into that, that small model I showed you. But let's say this company has a 25% growth rate for the next five years. 8% thereafter. I'm breaking a lot of rules in DCF, but now we're in the pricing game. I don't care about the rules anymore. Okay? Payout ratio is 20% for the high growth phase. It's much higher in stable growth because as my growth drops, my beta, let's keep things simple. I could have made the beta chain, but let's say it's one. It's an average risk stock. And, for the, and the growth is going to last for five years. It's com this company's cost of equity is 11.5%. Let's suppose the question I had for you is, given this high growth rate, how much of a PE ratio should I pay? That equation I showed in the previous page, I go plung the numbers. 20% payout ratio, 25% growth, 11.5% cost of equity. That's a high growth phase. In stable growth, 8% growth rate forever. And I discounted back to today. The PE ratio that I get for the stock is 28.75. What is that even telling me? If I did a two-stage dividend discount model valuation of the stock, the value per share that I would get would be 28. So think of this as an intrinsic PE. I know we're not in the intrinsic valuation, but if you ask me for an intrinsic P, I can compute an intrinsic P by plugging into these numbers. So I work out this number for you. And you say, okay, that looks reasonable. You buy the stock at 28.75 times earnings. Remember what we said the nightmare scenario was? Tomorrow you wake up and you get a surprise, a bad surprise. What's the surprise you get? That growth in the future is not going to be 20%. It's actually going to be 15 10%. What form does this surprise usually take? Is it an angel in the middle of the night that shows up and says your growth is going to be low? How do earn growth surprises usually manifest themselves with stocks? What's, what's the mechanism that usually delivers this surprise to you? It's usually an earnings report, right? Where the, uh, the company comes out and says, hey guys, we used to grow at 20%, we just lost a digit, we're now at two. You say, oh my God, and you adjust, right? 
So here's what I did. Because I've created this very simplistic company, I said, what if I kept everything else constant and changed just the growth rate during the high growth phase? So what you have here in this graph is what happens to the P-E ratio as the growth in the first five years goes from 25% down to 5%. That's a negative surprise or a positive surprise. I'll give you the easy part of this graph first. As growth increases, the P-E ratio increases. As growth decreases, the P-E ratio decreases. You say, why are there four columns? I looked at four interest rate scenarios. From a low interest rate scenario, which in those days when I did this was 4%, now it would be 2%, to a high interest rate scenario where your T-bond rate is 10%. Under every interest rate scenario, as growth increases, P-E increases. But notice that under my low interest rate scenarios, P-E ratios go up a lot more. They're much more sensitive to changes in my growth rate. So I have an intuitive question. Why, when interest rates are low, are P-E ratios much more sensitive to changes in the growth rate? What's the value of growth? It's all in the future, right? As my interest rates go up, what happens to the present value of growth? It gets lower. In fact, let's take an extreme example. Let's say you're in Venezuela and have high growth in the future. When your interest rates are 500,000%, what's the value of future growth? Zero. What if I surprise you to have more growth than you thought you did? I don't care. As interest rates climb, the value of growth drops. You start to care less and less about growth. As interest rates come down, growth becomes a bigger component of value. It's a present value effect. And surprises about growth are going to have a bigger impact. You see where I'm going? I said the mechanism that delivers growth surprises what? Earnings reports, right? So if you believe this graph, what should you expect to see? Earnings reports. Are we in a low interest rate? Let's make, get this out of the way. Are we in a low interest rate environment in the US? Or? We're in extraordinarily low. So earnings surprises in this market should have a much bigger impact on the stock price and the P-E ratio than earnings reports 10 years ago and definitely 30 years ago. It's not that markets are getting crazier, but when interest rates are low, you should expect to see more volatility. So the next time you hear people say, well, volatility is up, it's, markets have gone crazy, one of the reasons it's up is because the growth component is now a much bigger component of your value and it swings around more as interest rates change. Question, Luisa? We'll talk about it. I'm going to take PEG. I don't like PEG ratios, and you're going to see very quickly why. But PEG ratios, you try to adjust for growth. In a, people claim that growth goes out of the equation, but you're going to see very quickly that that's not necessarily true because it does stay in in very strange and complicated ways. Then I looked at risk. I used to beta 1. I said, what will happen if the beta goes from... 0.75. Again, the obvious thing is as risk increases, given any growth rate, the P-E ratio decreases. But I'm going to use this as a mechanism for maybe providing some advice to a high-growth, high-risk company. Let's give the high-growth, high-risk company some characteristics. Let's suppose my high-growth, high-risk company has a growth rate of 20% and a beta of 2. So right now, here's where I am. I'm trading at 7 or 8 times earnings. So I have a high-growth rate and a high risk. So I'm the CEO, you're my advisor. And I'm facing two mutually exclusive paths. One is I can go for still more growth. In which case, where am I stuck in this graph? I'm stuck in this last section. I'm moving up and down that last section. Or I can go for less risk. In which case, I move across the graph. Where's the payoff greater? Going for more growth and still more growth or reducing risk here? I think reducing risk is a bigger payoff. It sounds obvious, but the prominent growth companies, they get so focused on growth and more growth and still more growth that sometimes I forget that bringing risk down can have a much bigger payoff, that sometimes giving up that extra 5% growth to make your company a less risky company can have a much bigger impact on your stock price. It's a trade-off. You'd love to have both high growth and low risk, but you have to choose which one. It depends on where you are in this graph. So we're going to use what we've learned about P ratios. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play the role of a very naive and stupid analyst. And I'm going to put out a recommendation, and you just shoot me down. You have all the ammunition you need. So here's my first job. I'm a country asset allocator. I come to you with, with countries are cheap. So I'll start. This was the easy one, so let's get this out of the way. I come to you, and in March of 2014, this is just after Russia had invaded Ukraine. I say, you know what? You should put all your money in Russia. It's trading at 
three times earnings. It was actually the PE ratio for Russia was close to three and a half times earnings. This one's an obvious one. Before you invest, you're going to stop and say, that's crazy. I'm not investing in Russia. Its PE ratio is low, but its risk is sky high. So that's the mechanism I want you to do. With every recommendation I make, I want you to play devil's advocate. I could be right, but tell me what I'm missing. So that was the easy one. Let's move forward. I got fired as a country analyst because I was so bad. I landed my feet. I'm now the beverage analyst. Don't ask me how I made that transition. I track beverage companies. This is, I'm sorry, oh, let's do an emerging market run, then we'll do the beverage companies. I become the emerging market analyst because I couldn't do all countries. I say my focus is emerging markets. June of 2000, that's what the emerging market PE ratios look like. They range from 14 to 24. And I've given you other information on the company, the interest rates at that point, the growth rate, and the risk. So if I pick based purely on PE ratios, Turkey looks really cheap, 12 times earnings. But it also has really high interest rates, really low growth, and fairly high risk. In pricing is all about finding mismatches, right? You want to get a low PE ratio. Let me go item by item. But you also want low interest rates, high growth, and low risk. Now you could try eyeballing the data, but it's going to get you really dizzy. Pricing is really all about statistics. What's the variable you're trying to explain here? PE ratios. What are the things you're worried about? The level of interest rates, how much growth there is, and how much risk there is. This is actually a country risk score that came from a country risk, um, you know, a service that measured country risk. So if I'm trying to explain PE ratios, and these are the three variables that worry me, here seems to be the obvious way to do it. I know I'm probably being simplistic on statistics. I have to check for all kinds of things. But let's say I ran a regression of PE ratios across these countries, so the countries you saw on the previous page, against interest rates, growth, and country risk. First thing I show you is the R squared. It's actually dazzlingly high for a finance regression. But don't get too dazzled. It's a small sample, and a couple of outliers can make it. But let's say the R squared meets your criteria. Let's read the rest of the regression. What's the 16.16 tell me, the base? It's actually telling me something about the level of stocks across the world. So it's my base number. The minus 7.94 on the interest rate coefficient tells me the higher the interest rates, the lower the PE ratio. The positive coefficient on growth in GDP says the higher the growth rate, the higher the PE ratio. And the coefficient, the negative coefficient on the country risk measure is the higher. Thank God. Everything is in the right direction. Don't expect that with regressions, because the data doesn't have to do what you'd like it to do. right? And when the data doesn't do what you'd like it to do, you can't bend the data and just change the coefficient. It is what it is. But he's saying, how am I going to use this to tell you which emerging markets are cheap and expensive? How am I going to use this? If you ask me, is Turkey cheap or expensive, what am I going to do? I'm going to go back, plug in the numbers for Turkey, the 25% growth rate, the low growth rate in the regression. I'm going to get a predicted PE for Turkey of 13.35. Much lower than the predicted PEs for the rest of the markets. But what do I compare the 13.35 to? I compare to the actual PE, which tells me Turkey is cheap even after I adjust for its low growth and its high interest rates. So what you see as my predicted PE is essentially my regression used to come up with PE ratios for these markets given the differences. If you're interested in emerging markets, obviously that data is from 2000. It's dated. You can go to Bloomberg, pull up the PE ratios for 20 emerging markets. You can do it from Capital IQ. You can also pull up numbers on growth and risk and you know, macro numbers. And it's actually a very interesting way of thinking about you know, our emerging markets, you know, which emerging markets look cheap. It's a, you're making a relative statement, right? You're saying, given how em other emerging markets are priced, these are the cheapest markets. Now, staying on PE ratios, let's move on to the entire market. Now, last week when I was talking at a macro conference, I was talking about the laziness of bubble arguments because much of what you see behind the bubble arguments, stocks are in a bubble, is that PE ratios today are higher than they've been historically. Whether Robert Schiller is making the argument or some equity research, that bo it boils down to as simple a mechanism as that. So let's start with, with the base of the argument. Here I've graphed out three different PE ratios. The standard PE ratio, which is the price divided by earnings. The second is what I call a normalized PE ratio, where I divide pi price by average earnings over the previous 10 years. And the third is price divided by average earnings adjust for inflation. Why? Because earnings from 10 years ago can't be compared. Before we get any f very fancy, do the three look like they move almost 
exactly together. So what did I tell you? All this finessing of the PE ratio is mostly a waste of time. You could have just done it with basic PEs, but it looks so much fancy. You took a 10-year average, you did inflation adjusting. Much of what the K, the, K, the Schiller PE does, basically does. There might be periods in history where the two create differences. But over this period, you could have told the same story using any version of the PE ratio. And here's what the story looks like. At least in January 2017, I'll update this to 2019, the PE ratios looked much higher than they'd been historically, but here's the catch. It depends on what your version of history is. If we compare it to 2000 and, no, 2009, from 96 to 2016, a 20-year average, it doesn't look that high, but if I go back to 1960, and that's the thing about comparing to history is, I don't know what history you're comparing to, but that seemed to be the basis. Stocks are overpriced because the PE ratio today is higher than it's been historically. Let's take that. Now let's, let's concede that. What do lawyers say when they accept a fact into, there's a word they use. You know, let's, see, let's use the lawyerly word. I don't know what it is, but let, go look it up and use it you know, in this place. Let's take that as a given. PE ratio today is higher than PE ratios have been historically. Now I'm going to take that and leap to the next statement, which is stocks are therefore overpriced. Can I make that statement, or what am I missing when I make that statement? What are the three things that drove your P-E ratio? Cost of equity, growth rate, and payout ratio slash return equity. Go back to basics. What causes P-E ratios to change? One is it could be changes in growth rate. So first question you should ask me is, is growth in earnings today higher than it's been historically? Because if it is, guess what? The P-E ratio today should be higher. Now, growth looks pretty much where it's been historically. It's 4.15%. It's not that different. So that's not the culprit. The second question you're going to ask me is, is the return on equity today higher than it's been? It is, but not that much. 17%, it used to be 16%, which leaves us with the cost of equity. What are the two components that go into cost of equity when you look at the market? Because it's, there's, there's three components for individual companies. For the market, there are only two, which is one is the risk-free rate, and the other is the risk premium. So let's focus in on the variable that has changed the most there. When I take the PE ratios today, the T-bond rate today is? 2.44%. The average PE comes from a period where the T-bond rate was 4, 5, or even 6%. Seems like such an obvious thing that you need to control for. And there's actually a very simple way in which you can agree, in which you can compare. Because if you just compare PE ratios across time, in periods of low interest rates, everything is going to look expensive. Okay? In periods of high interest rates, everything is going to look cheap. Making comparisons across time without controlling for those differences is a recipe for disaster. So here's my comparison that I run, and this is something I do every year. I invert the PE ratio. It's called the earnings yield. It's earnings divided by price. The nice thing about earnings to price is I can put it on the same graph as the T-bond rate so you can see how they move together. So think of the earnings yield as what you're getting on stocks as kind of a collective return. Think of the T-bond rate, what you're making on bonds. See those, the top two lines? That's earnings to price ratios and T-bond rates, and you can see how much they move together. See, what's this third purple line? I actually took the difference in the T-bond rate and the T-bull rate and graphed it. Yeah. What does the T-bond rate minus T-bull rate tell me? It tells me how upward sloping the term structure is. And if that number is zero, I have a flat term structure. And if that number is negative, I have a downward sloping yield curve. You think, why do you care? For the last year or so, that you've been reading stories every time the yield curve inverts. What is it supposed to predict? A recession. So the yield curve historically has been a predictor of economic growth. I'm ready to answer the question, are stocks today overpriced or underpriced? Here's what I did. I took earnings to price ratios over the 50 years that Schiller and everybody else is using, ran a regression against the level of the T-bond rate and the difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bond rate. First, the R squared is about 42%. Not bad. I'm trying to explain the market. I'm not bringing in anything other than just interest rates. Those two variables explain 42% of the variation. Every 1% increase in the T-bond rate increases my earnings to price ratio. Remember when it increases, you know, it's, you've got to invert in your mind, which means your P-E ratio is going to be lower when T-bond rates are higher. And every increase in my slope of the yield curve makes my P-E ratio higher. The one thing about the, the, the term structure it is no longer statistically significant. It used to be more significant until 2008. And that's one reason last year when the inverted yield curve frenzy started, I said, hey, let's stop and look at the data. 
I know that historically yield curves have inverted, there's been lower growth, but it doesn't seem to be happening anymore. Something seems to have changed in the system. So let me ask you a question. Historically, why have inverted yield curves been good predictors of economic growth? What causes yield curves to invert usually? It's not, see, yield curve is short-term rates and long-term rates, right? Long-term rates are driven by market expectations. The short-term rates, there is a factor, an outside factor, that could cause short-term rates to shoot up. 1981. You know why short-term rates shot up? Because Paul Volcker came into the Fed and said, I'm going to break the back of inflation. And that's the, that's the part of the yield curve that the Fed is the most power over. Historically, the slope of the yield curve has measured the Fed's power in the market. And historically, the Fed in the U.S. has had some power in terms of at least shifting short-term growth. You know what the last 10 years is telling us? That maybe the Fed's power is fading, and that should be scary. But it's a reality that we face now, and that's why you should be a little skeptical about inverted yield arguments and everything else, because we're in a point in time where that's not true. What I'd like to do, what I'd like you to do, is take today's T bond rate and today's t bull rate and plug it into the regression. They're easy to find. You'll get a predicted earnings to price ratio for the S&P 500. Then flip it, compared to the actual PE. You can then judge whether stocks today are overvalued or undervalued given the history of the relationship between stock prices and interest rates. So I will see you on Monday. Without the uh, country risk in it, the PE, is it a better R score or a worse R score? That, uh, that particular regression will be yes. slightly worse R score. The problem with country risk management is you can't use ratings. Because ratings are not numerical, they're not linear. Right, but this also need not be numerical. It yes. could be an ordinal scale for all we know. Yeah, so that's always a problem. You, you don't know whether it's linear or non linear. That you can control for, right? Because there you can actually graph out P ratios against this country risk and see what you get. And if it's non linear, maybe do a okay. transformation okay. of the risk measure. Maybe the square root is a much better measure. So you can use statistical. As long as there's a relationship, your bigger worry is maybe there's no relationship between what the service thinks about country risk and what stocks are pricing. Right. So you could even use solving CBS risk. Yeah, I was thinking, or the ERP, you, yes. you have a prop, your own proper ERP. Defaults, it's a rating based measure. I've converted right. the rating into a right. cost. Right. So right. you could use any of those, but basically you're trying to capture different countries. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want me to drop this off? Or can I put it on my desk? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, Professor. One question. Yeah. When you talk about the about the finding the intrinsic drivers in the multiples, for example, the P multiples, mm -hmm. uh, how do how do you uh, come up with the growth rates for each of the companies and the and the wax and and all the and, all, and, and the payout ratio? Are you supposed to calculate them and then do compare? You, why you, you know, but remember, you're not trying to do that to actually get a P ratio. You're using it to back it out. You're using it to come up with the variables to ask questions. To come up with the variables. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah, you, if you plug it back, all you're going to yes, get yes. is a two-stage dividend discount model, which exactly. you could have got by using it. So in fact, you